He's been bad for most of set 11 Inkborn Fables so far, but finally in the past couple of patches, Lilia is on top. She does have some conditions, but she is one of the highest capped AP comps in the game that you can play to win out with many different options in case you miss. So in this edition of TFT Academy, let's go ahead and dive into what makes Lilia strong, how to play her, and why she is such a fantastic roommate. Let's start off by talking about what the general game plan is and understanding Lilia a little bit deeper. So the first thing that's really important to recognize is that Lilia is generally very resource hungry. You need to have two fully itemized carries and frontline, and preferably some of these off carries have a couple of really good support items as well. And so it just needs a lot of items and a lot of econ because the composition is mainly based on four and five costs as well. The general approach to Lilia is you go for a fast eight and you play your strongest board, and then you try to avoid rolling if possible, until you get to level eight. Sometimes in rare scenarios, you are holding a lot of pairs and you want to roll at six or seven. I would suggest rolling only a couple of times unless you feel very confident that you are able to slingshot your econ back. In high resource portals, for example, they give you a bunch of gold. Maybe you can roll a little bit deeper. Or if an encounter gives you a free reroll for the turn, you can definitely use that and upgrade your board and spend some of your resources. But if you do get free rerolls that you can save, try to save until level eight so that way you can go for all the four costs and hit some of those five costs you're generally stable if you can hit two out of the following three units of lilia nautilus and morgana in that order i think i'd rather have lilia two and nautilus two than have uh, lilia two morgana two and nautilus one just because you kind of need to have that stable front line but any two of the three is good in uncommon scenarios you're able to get lilia two and nautilus one morgana one and you can get to nine if you have fully upgraded support units. And that kind of depends on the context of the lobby. What are your augments like? Are people on the weaker side? Do you have so much gold that you should be able to get to nine and roll anyways? Or maybe you're in a three-way contest and it's just very unlikely you hit Nautilus 2. So you're going to try to push levels instead. Try avoid really rolling to zero on level eight if it's possible. Because if you do end up rolling to zero on eight, it's going to be really hard to get to nine. And level nine is when you unlock the true power of the composition. If you're stuck on eight, a lot of times you're playing for like a fifth, maybe a fourth if you hit everything and you have a lot of HP. So just keep that in mind that if you are stuck on eight, you're probably just playing for placements. The best opener, in my opinion, is Story vs. Zyra because it anchors well in the early mid game and gives you pivot options. The second best opener, in my opinion, is Faded with Ari as the AP opener. And then third would be Mythic, which sounds kind of weird because Mythic would be a trait that lends itself easily into Lilia, but unless you have a mythic emblem or a reason to play vertical mythic, it takes a while for it to get online because you need four full combats for it to get the, the bonus. And that just means that your stage two is going to be weak. Even if you have Kog'Maw fully upgraded with Cho'Gath, you end up losing a handful of fights to other boards just because you don't have half your trait online. Important to remember, this AP comp is burst oriented, so swapping a two star for a one star can be risky. What that means is if you have a one star Lilia and you're like, wow, I hit Lilia, I'm going to sell my Zoe 2 and my Zyra 2 to play Morg 1, Lilia 1, you might not kill anything because you have a threshold of which you're trying to burst and kill things. And if you don't kill things, you have to wait for your next round of casts. And by then the fight can completely change. So a lot of players, they just say like, okay, I'm going for a roll down. I hit one Lilia, one Morgana, and I'm going to swap out all my two stars. Uh, that could be really, really dicey. That also applies to frontline as well. So let's say you're playing like the Aatrox Shen uh, Alawi frontliner, and you're going to sell like Shen 2 and Aatrox 2 for one star Tom Kench, one star Nautilus, and things like that. Uh, you can actually put yourself in a really tough spot. So just try to play some good fundamental TFT of justifying uh, the two stars over the one stars, unless the one star is that important to the comp. And the other thing to keep in mind is that Lilia isn't really a front to back AP comp. It's not like Syndra. Syndra tries to kill one thing at a time. Lilia ends up trying to throw orbs and gets the back line and Morgana AOEs it down. And so that tag team duo allows you to kill backline units like Ash or the Mirror or other units like Syndra if they're not careful. The general good portals for this are things that give you high resource and high cap. So Titician's Crown is good because it gives you a reason to play another support unit like another Sage, another Heavenly, another Dragon Lord. Scuttle Puddle just gives you a ton of gold and items. And speaking of items, Radiant Blessing, Radiant Item, Artifact, Anvil, those are all good things. Trainer Sentinels is mainly for the vertical Mythic Invoker variations of Lilia which we'll talk about in a little bit. But generally speaking, this one is a little bit dicier because Chainer Sentinels is very uh, hit or miss. So if you don't get the right trainer for it, then you probably have to do something else. So let's talk about some of the core units game plan of how you actually end up transitioning this board. 
So we talked about the Storm Weaver Zyra, so I'm just going to go off of that as a building block. This game plan really wants to play around three Mythic and three Sages with some support units and traits. In this case, the best opener is just playing around the Storm Weaver Warden line with Garen, Jax, and then Zyra in the back line. Zyra ends up being the item holder, and you actually do not mind at all of just like fully itemizing her with everything. Like you can give her Shiv and Shoujin and morello or something like that even though it's not necessarily as efficient on zyra it's just that you can pile it onto her because you're going to sell her anyways at level five you add in like the atrox maybe for the bruiser with riven then at level six you start getting in the three costs that are really important riven becomes zoe Jax becomes a Lowey, and then diana for the sage level seven you can just splash in a janna if you want or any other synergy that makes sense maybe even another bruiser and then level eight is when you start fully transitioning you're holding all these things like zyra and zoe becomes lilia morgana the garen becomes nautilus as the warden and then you eventually transition to mythic with nico and then if you can find wukong great otherwise you just kind of play whatever support item that makes sense a lot of times you're playing things like soraka for example at level nine you can definitely work in recon or another unit that makes a lot of sense for the composition based on what you're hitting but we talked about the other variant that you could possibly play which is around mythic and invoker so another game plan you can try to go around is seven mythic and four invoker with a mythic emblem if you open with like chogath 2 and kogma 2 you can play mythic caitlin and kind of build off of that so early you start off with Kogmar, Caitlyn, Cho'Gath, and Malphite. Then add Nico at five because you want to get the heavenly bonus. Add Tom Kench at six, you can get five mythic. And you're actually going to play like five mythic for a while. Like on level eight, I know I have seven mythic right here, but the reality is you're not going to hit Huey very often. And sometimes you don't hit like Lilia or Nautilus. So you're going to play like five mythic plus whatever makes sense in the back line, which we'll talk about in a little bit for other flex units. Don't feel like you're obligated to play seven mythic on seven or anything like that because you end up playing like a really terrible composition with like Bard one and maybe like Tom Kench one, Lilia one and all this stuff. It ends up being pretty mediocre. So if you end up in this spot, just make sure to try to play around a core of five mythic and good units. Then when you hit things like Huey, transition to seven mythic. At nine, you're going to go for Zier and land on four invoker. And this also goes the other way. If you end up getting plus one invoker, you can end up cutting a unit and trying to play for six invoker instead. It is a little bit dicier to try to go for six invoker because your front line tends to be the thing that you cut. Like, for example, you would probably cut like a Lowey and try to go for like Janna. That's not something that I personally like a lot. And that's kind of why six invoker can feel weird. Uh, and usually you want to only do that if you get a plus one emblem and it's on like a target dummy. So you at least have some sevens of front line. So what happens if you miss and you roll down? We talked about like if you roll for Lilia on fast eight and you're not hitting or what are some things that you can do to deviate from that game plan the first thing is to recognize that you actually can just change your entire course of what you want to play you don't actually have to go into lilia and invokers with sages you can actually just play ghostly ap based off the opener we talked about if you look at this board this ghostly board instead of just playing around diana you just tag into shen and then you end up playing like the four ghostly with morgana and then uh at level seven you are just rolling for Zoe 3, Zyra 3, and then preferably like a Lowey 3. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out our TFT Academy tier list and the patch list update that I talked about that discusses Zoe and Zyra ghostly reroll. So you get a good understanding of how to transition this comp into that one. And then this also might be one of the things where you just hit like a really good augment for it at 4 2. Like let's say you are holding, you know, four copies of Zyra and like five copies of Zoe. And then you hit prismatic ticket you're like okay i'm not going to go into lilia i'm just going to roll for this so there's a couple of ways you can justify going into it depending on your spot the usual awkwardness of doing this is that you end up committing to a item holder zyra so she might have like some bad items on her relative to what you want as a carry so just keep that in mind you might want to distribute your items to set yourself up for both what that means by that is like if you, you don't necessarily want to put like morello onto zyra because at three star morello zyra is really really inefficient as a primary carry so just keep those things in mind. The other thing you can think about is playing around Umbral as a package. So if you have Loon, she's an invoker that tags with Lilia, and she can item hold for Lilia. We talked about playing one stars versus two stars. If you have two star Loon and you have, you know, two star Silas, play those as your primary with Lilia as your support. Speaking of Silas, you can actually tag into Bruisers and Sage with him. Tom Kench is your mythic Bruiser, and then you can play Galio and Riven alongside it. This actually goes into the Silas Sage flex line, 
which plays around like Bruiser, Sage, and Silas as a carry. And you can go Lilia, Silas, and kind of have a hybrid between two comps, which is really cool. And if you play that, I mean, you are playing Flex TFT, which is really hard to pull off, but really rewarding and gives you multiple outs that you can play for. So that way you don't feel like you're just stuck rolling for only the Lilia units. And then don't forget, you know, you can always just slap in more support units. If you are missing Nautilus, for example, you can always play Lee Sin and then go into four Dragonlord if you hit Rakan. You can always just tag in more heavenly units if you find a reason to go for more heavenly for whatever reason. So always think about like what is good for the team. An example of a bad support unit is Kiana because yes, maybe you hit Lee Sin and you want to play with Kiana for the duelist, but she gives attack damage to the whole team and your win condition is AP bursting the back line. So AD is going to be completely useless. So just think about like what the support can actually do for your team and whether or not it actually fits into the big picture. The itemization for this build is pretty dynamic. There are a couple of things that you absolutely want. So when you play two invoker, you get five mana to all your allies, meaning that the 50 mana threshold for Lilia now becomes 45. Shojin gives 15 per auto, which means three autos with the invoker. It means Lilia should be casting. So it's much more efficient that way. Versus four invoker is different because it gives you much more mana and it gives you the flat 10 that you can use the interval for blue buff and it's more efficient that way. Lily also cares about that burst. We talked about how she just wants to kill backline. So more AP on top of the Shojin is really good. But if you aren't able to hit just straight up all the rods in the universe, you can go for like Nashers, Archangels, uh, as well as some other AP items that might be good. Gunblade is okay, but it ends up being a little bit more of a support item. And that means you're probably playing like multiple carries, like not just Lily and Morgana, but maybe you have items on Wukong and Rakan. So it's kind of the sum of those parts. I'd only do that if I have too many swords I need to kill. Some good artifacts for Lilia. Mana Zane is insane on her because she casts super fast and then can snipe backline within the first few seconds of the fight. Zonia's allows her to potentially clutch fights at the very end where they can't kill her. So she ends up getting like the nice last little bits of burst to finish out the fight. And the Sniper's Focus ends up being good because it counts the distance between her and the target. So when the orb rolls to the back line, the Sniper's Focus is doing a lot of damage that way. Morgana takes a bunch of the utility. So she ends up being like an AOE support unit. And then the third item can just be like another AP item. Or you can give her like a mana item, like adaptive, or let's say you get like random blue buff and Shojin. I mean, in reality, it's kind of funny because you could go like Shojin, 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 like three Shojins in the comp. But uh, a lot of times you're not really going out of your way to prioritize the third Morgana item because you just need so many items. You want to get three item Lilia, three item Nautilus, and then uh, ideally three item Morgana plus other stuff. It just gets really expensive and resource heavy. One thing I want to give a shout out to is I think Blighting Jewel is actually really good on Morgana. Blighting Jewel is one of the new artifacts that says when it deals magic damage, it drains its MR. And so Morgana ends up being really good because she throws a big snowflake. And then as she does every tick of damage, it's draining their MR. So it's really, really nice. One thing to know is I believe it does stack with the percentage shred. So uh, this is a percentage reduction and this is a flat reduction. And they usually tend to stack on top of each other. So if you do Shiv and Blighting Jewel, it can be a pretty devastating combo on Morgana. Nos wants a lot of utility frontline. He actually gets a lot of stats already, so you kind of care about him casting a lot. So things like Vow and Adaptive Helm are good because it helps him cast twice. He's just so impactful if he casts twice because he's going to stun carries for a long time and you can swing the fight that way. Redemption is also really good as another tier-based item, but you could also just put other generic frontline items. I just put a few examples like Crown Guard, Dragon's Claw, uh, Steadfast Heart, just like whatever you could really afford. Crown Guard is actually kind of hard to justify. It's just good in the stats, but uh, the reality is you kind of need the rods. So again, kind of hard to justify uh, item economy-wise. As for artifacts, the best one for Nautilus is Horizon Focus, which deals a percentage of your opponent's max HP as magic damage if you stun them. And so Nautilus stuns, does a big chunk of damage, and you're going to look at the damage and be like, wait, what? Nautilus is like my second or maybe most damaged... Uh, in the <laughs> in the fight and that has to do with a lot of times with horizon focus eternal winter and diamond hands are just also generically good so you can start to see why artifact anvil is pretty good for this composition you have a lot of different hits and i didn't even list all of them you could always take some more defensive ones or generic ones like treacherous glass or suspicious trench coat you do want to itemize like units like Huey in some of these like late game scenarios or any other five costs so if you do just give him like shojin or leftover ap especially if you're playing the vertical mythic variation Huey is your secondary carry and not morgana Give him things like the Morello, potentially the Shiv, um, but you know it's going to be whatever usually you have left over.
So augments, in terms of the philosophy, generally you always want to start the game by taking something like economy or items. Economy being things that gives you a bunch of gold, so that way you can hit your level 8 with a bunch of resources and roll a ton for your forecasts. You also can just take an item augment because, you know, things like shock treatment, for example, could be really, really good and then snowball your tempo that way. If you're on your second augment, think about taking a combat augment if you can. Otherwise, you can just take another item based augment, in my opinion, because in the mid game, you ideally want like a three item Zyra plus, you know, two item frontline or vice versa, three item frontline, two item Zyra. So you can just try to beat a bunch of boards and uh, you're not really going to do that if you have like one item Zyra two and like, you know, 1.5 items on your allow your Shen. So it's pretty safe to take something like item or combat. On the third augment, take a combat augment if you haven't had one already, because it's just going to be hard to outscale if you take no combat augments. So at least have one so you can keep up the pace with the tempo. Uh, but if not, uh, usually items, again, are safe because you end up hitting like, you know, really good item based augments like lucky gloves and could be really, really powerful. To get a little bit more granular, let's talk about like why some of these specific ones are doing so well in the data. Simpack is probably the best item based silver augment because it just gives you the number of items it gives you the most and you have to lose it the HP. But a lot of times with these kinds of AP openers, you can have an awkward and rough start, especially if you're playing like mythic because you need those four fights to ramp. So Simpack ends up giving you that reason to like not have to rush too much and you're going to get a lot of items. If you need specific items, component buffet is nice because every item you get is an anvil and you can get specifically tons of rods and tears because that's what you really want for this composition best friends is just generic strong combat augment it gives you a little bit of combat stats it gives you attack speed which helps you cast a little bit faster and risky moves you just need a lot of econ so you get econ at a delayed interval which can be dicey but hey you're looking for the level eight roll down and hard spiking around then so not that big of a deal Sanyan ends up being really good for the sage variant of Lilia but it's not particularly super good for the mythic invoker variant so just keep that in mind uh, but in the Sage variant, Stan United is fantastic. Shock Treatment we talked about. Honestly, Combat Caster is probably just overtuned as an augment. They need to nerf it. Or it's probably fine that it's good for this entire set. And then maybe in the future set, they become worse because the units are different. But right now, especially because you're like casting so often, um, just getting that scaling defensive combat power is really, really good. Magic Wand, it gives you AP, which is that you want in a rod. What's not the love? Unify resistance because your front line can be a little bit fragile at times if you don't have a lot of items. Like a lot of times people are going to be over prioritizing, like making all these backline items. I've seen people go for Shojin, Deathcap, JG, Morello, Shiv, and have zero frontline items before. So if you do have that instance, uh, Unify resistance could be uh, pretty helpful there. Jewelos 3 is the best prismatic for this comp period because it just gives you an immense amount of burst potential. And that's what you really want. The faster you can kill the backline, the faster you'll win. It also is one of the augments that might help you win some of these matchups that are tougher for Lilia, like single target melee carries that are really difficult to deal with. Like right now, I think Lee Sin is still a tough matchup for Lilia because uh, the melee unit just doesn't die fast enough and all this also targeting can be a little bit weird. So uh, Jewel Lotus 3 kind of helps a lot for that. Lucky Gloves is kind of the same reason as like Stimpak, just gives you a bunch of items, but it fully itemizes and gives them good items. Tiny but Deadly is the second best prismatic combat augment to think about and gives you like a lot of attack speed, which is really nice. Just think of it as like a mana generation for your whole team, which is good. And then New Recruit, you can always use plus one team size, another Sage, another Dragon Lord, another Heavenly, an Altruist, so on and so forth. Really powerful with those support traits. Talk about the X Factor, Exalted. Exalted is always one of the keys that helps tip this comp in your favor. Some of the best variants usually involve either Lilia or Morgana. Interestingly enough, the Lilia and Morgana variation is not that good, but I think it's because Galio is a little bit of a, a weird outlier on that one. But in these variants, you just basically get it uh, for free. You play Lilia and Diana, and then uh, Irelia is just good to play in the comp because Irelia is the best legendary in the game. And then in this version with Lilia and Soraka, you just play Zyra and you go into Sages anyways. And then this variation that people play is often tagged with Duelist with Diana, Soraka, and Tristana, but Aloon is an invoker. So you can actually use this variation to play into invoker Lilia with uh, those support traits ends up being not too bad so just keep your eyes peeled for variations like that 
Positioning is actually the easiest part of this composition because you can default position in like almost every scenario, like 80 plus percent of the scenarios. Just put Lily in the corner, Morgana far away from her, and then just kind of spread out accordingly. Usually when you change your positioning, it's to make sure your opponents aren't getting the optimal spots and lineups on you. So if your opponent has, you know, Shroud or Zephyrs, like that's usually when you're moving things or really powerful CC or, you know, anti-backline. Like they have like Caitlyn 3 or something like that. Something that kind of manipulates your targeting. Um, try to make sure that like Lily and Janna is like, you know, helping you swap there. And then the other things you want to think about are uh, where Nautilus is aimed at. Nautilus will be a really impactful unit. You want to get him towards the enemy carry. And then Rakan is the same thing too. Uh, people don't actually think about Rakan as a CC unit, but he ends up being really impactful if you can land on opponent carries as well with his AoE. So if you do end up getting a spot where Rakan can uh, tag team with Nautilus, it's a very subtle but powerful effect that you can get to swing fights. Another thing to note about our TFT Academy positioning thing is that there's no units around Lilia within a two hex radius, and that's very intentional. We want to keep Lilia safe away from like, you know, largest clump, especially if your opponent's playing like Nautilus in the mirror or Nautilus in Sniper Warden or enemy Morganas themselves, like things like that. Lilia's by herself, so she's safe. The downside is if you have like Diana 1 and, and the Lowey 1 and Nautilus 2, some units like Lee Sin and Kane will just kill Diana and then just walk to Lilia. So just make sure Lilia isn't completely abandoned if you have a weak side. Another thing to note is that if you have Spark instead of Shiv, like on Nautilus, try to keep him a little bit safer and potentially aim him where you feel like Lilia is going to be able to burst because ultimately, uh, if you have the Spark really far away from Lilia, like for whatever reason, you like swap Nautilus over here in the top left, there's a pretty good chance that Lilia might not ever damage the units that are actually shredded. So there you have it, the Lily Guide in a nutshell with all the tips that I have for it to get you started. There's a lot of small nuances as well that you could do depending on the situation with your augments, portals, encounters, and items. But uh, that's what makes it really fun. And I think that this composition is flexible enough to give you many options, but ultimately still a composition that you can kind of play as your core game plan. So if you are a person that wants to one trick Lilia, I think you can do it. But if you also want to play flex Lilia, you also can do that as well. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below if you have any tips or tricks. And I'll see you guys next time.